Alrighty, we are here. What's up, man? Up, dude. That two minute What's reel, you up? just you can play that again. That was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I can watch that again. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, some good clips there. Yeah. Uh, actually, Mover helped me in the way that uh, I didn't know about the Dvids thing or whatever it's called, like the I defense. Didn't yeah, he's he's smart on all this stuff, Nerd. but he's like, yeah, if you go in there, there's all this this footage and stuff, and so yeah, it's uh, pretty cool. He's the Air Force guy, Casmo. <laughs> they got it all doped out. Birds. <laughs> yeah, they got it all figured out. Uh, let's see, let's get caught up with the chat. Somebody was saying that Mover's probably uh, lurking. He probably is. He's probably spying on Gonky to make sure he doesn't step out of line. Or yeah, you better uh, help, dude. You better mute mute your phone. He might phone phone call check you. <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> that's true in fact i'm gonna make sure discord's turned off because i'll get pings and stuff uh yep gonky is absolutely here 100 percent as promised we, we we've been talking about doing this for a while because i had mover on the last time and then trying to work through uh gonky schedule and uh, we finally got it to work out so here we are yep which is good to have you here thanks for coming on yeah man no oh, it's good and we got Jake in the background helping us run things, keeping an eye on uh, stuff for us. But uh, yeah, so we'll just kind of get into it. Welcome to the show. Uh, long time coming to have you on here. But we, like I was saying before uh, we started, you know, kind of the idea here is just kind of talk about aviation, talk about our careers and experiences and stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, I've, I've, you know, you and I have talked several times, but I've never got to like have a no kidding conversation with you one on one and sort of in depth. So I know sort of about your career which sounds kind of interesting you've done some some wild things and and mover was telling me some stuff too you've got some army experience it sounds like uh work on a little staff. bit not not yeah. not in flying capacity but in staff capacity. right right no <clears throat> but uh the worst kind the, the staff <laughs> capacity so so maybe we can talk a little bit about that but uh, yeah i mean tell us about you and um and your, your how you started your career and and well you were in the navy so what's wrong with you <clears throat> <laughs> yeah exactly man right no they're the only ones that would say yes right so uh, kind of <laughs> like my wife but anyways um no i uh <clears throat> i grew up you know in saudi arabia and my dad was an aircraft mechanic so dad was a aircraft mechanic uh actually in nam and uh and then throughout the rest of his professional career so i grew up in dahran saudi arabia which uh from 70 she's nine to 94 five ish so I was there during, you know, a lot of the, there's a lot of conflict over there, right? We talked a little bit about it in the past and then obviously the Gulf War. So there's always airplanes flying around as a little kid, just like I never went to air shows. But I mean, every day, if you want an air show, man, just go outside, <clears throat> see the, the Saudi Air Force flying. And um, and then, yeah, I, uh, you know, uh, slugged it out through school. I got uh, I actually went to the University of North Dakota and that's where I got a lot of my flying ratings civilian ratings and then uh tried to get in the military but i couldn't i couldn't cut it <clears throat> excuse me i i couldn't uh i couldn't pass the the physical because when i was a kid i had asthma and that was a, a showstopper and then um i was like all right well i'll go fly a commercial plane so i kind of went down that route for a little bit uh, flew some weather mod which is really cool not chemtrails but weather modification. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I got, uh, you know, everything's about timing, right? And aviation Casmo timing is a huge, huge part of part of your luck, I would say. And, uh, September 11th happened. And I always tell everybody as a joke, they lowered the standard because they needed people. And I happened to be working with the Navy recruiter and they let me in. So, uh, that's how that's a, condensed version of how I, how I got in the Navy. I, I had applied to the air force. Uh, they said, no, I had applied to the Navy a couple of times when I was in college. They said, no, the Marines almost let me in, but again, I couldn't get the waiver for asthma. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, after nine 11 happened, uh, I tried one more time and I got lucky. I got in, I didn't realize this at the time, but the recruiter that got me in, I didn't realize there was two waivers. There's a regular waiver for asthma, and then there's an aviation waiver for asthma. Nobody told oh. me this. Yeah, so why would they? Well, all right, I'm in OCS, you know, doing push-ups and getting turned into a sugar cookie every day. And uh, like they call me out of training. They're like, hey, you can't go to flight school. 
I'm like, why not? They're like, you don't have a waiver for asthma. I'm like, yeah, I do. Like, no, no, you got a waiver to be an OCS, but you don't have one to be a pilot. And so, dude, I had to go take, do all these tests. And uh, long story short, uh, I was below average in all the tests that they do because of, you know, the lung damage. And then uh, the, the, the key question was, uh, hey, at what age did you stop having asthma? That was the key. And, I mean, I didn't know. <clears throat> so I literally, I just, I remember telling the doctor, I was like, I don't know. 12 or 13, which I can't remember the two ages. And he's like, he's like, well, which one is it? And I'm like, well, 12. <laughs> right. Which one? And then he literally tells me, he's like, that's the cutoff. You made it. Uh, and I was like, oh, <laughs> dude, you know? um, he didn't say you made it, but he said, that's the cutoff. I'm going to submit your packet. Now we'll see what happens. And then I found out the day I graduated OCS. So I, this is like, I'm sure maybe we had cell phones. I didn't have one. But I called my parents, man. I said, hey, you're either going to come down and see me graduate or you're just going to come down and take me home. Because that was what was, I was either going to get uh, discharged for not being medically qualified or I was going to go to flight school. And I found out, man, the day I graduated. So I did like most of OCS, not even knowing if I was going to make it. And uh, that was a pretty sweet call. So, um, yeah. So the Navy let me okay. in and the uh, um, – yeah, it's it's been uh it's been a pretty good ride really oh how did your so asthma which i didn't even know you could like grow out of asthma is that that's really <clears throat> a, a thing it is a thing to be completely honest my uh i think i had a very loving mother so every time i coughed you know i was with the inhaler and i think <laughs> i think i had just become uh you know, uh, kind of hooked to that thing uh, because, you know, I won't say I told the truth to the doctor regarding when I stopped having issues, but I guess what I'll say is one day I just decided I'm not going to, because I was trying so hard to get in, man. My whole, my dream was to be a Navy fighter pilot, right? And I literally, it sounds crazy, <clears throat> but I literally took my inhaler and I threw it in the garbage and I said, I'm either going to choke out, die and die, or I'm, I'm, I'm going to find a way. And I tell you what, dude, I'm pretty sure I had withdrawals for about three weeks, man. I had the most gnarly asthma attacks and I would just lay on the floor hmm. and I would just do, I, you know, I was, I, I would say my prayers and I would, man, it's, I, I go to sleep, pass out. I don't know. But, uh, after about three weeks of that, I, I was through it and I've never, ever, ever you, had an issue. You're like, you're like shaking off cocaine. You're Dude, just, that, <laughs> like, it's cold turkey off the well, asthma spray. <laughs> what, it's, uh, what is it? Budosamine or what? I don't know. You can become addicted to that stuff. Sure. So, yeah. uh, you know, this, that, all, all of that happened um, many years ago. And, uh, you know, I just, you know, aviation, like we said, timing is so important. So, you know how it is, man there's a, there's a window that you've got to hit if you're going to be a military aviator, whether it's helos, jets, you know, heavies, whatever. Um, and it, they're all great career paths and they're all special when you compare it to, you know, just civilian flying. Um, and I mean, you, we all get one shot and I'm like, man, I'm going to choke out. <laughs> I'm going to make it, you know? So, um, hmm. so I, you know, I made it. Um, uh, no, I was very, uh, I was very lucky. Uh, I, I'm not, you know, I, I'll never tell Mover this is face, but I think he's kind of a he's a, he's gifted, you know, in a lot of things. Um, I've flown with him and stuff, and he he definitely uh, he definitely has a mindset for it more than I do. I think I have to work at it. So I was never one of those guys that won top stick or whatever the the awards yeah, yeah. were because I never got them. Yeah, <laughs> so, we're just happy to be here. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> I'm like every day that I'm on the schedule, it's like yes. Yeah. So. Well, if, if Mover's lurking, he, he'll show himself now because you've said good things about him. Yeah, uh, it's true. I mean, he, he did win, like, whatever it is in the Air Force, like uh, top hands or whatever it is. I don't know. Top hands. What, There's I a lot did? I can do with that. But I <laughs> <laughs> the Air Force, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, all right. So, how did going to uh, that North Dakota? Because I, I we had guys, too, in the Army that... Um, basically showed up to flight school they already had like their civilian ratings for 
instruments and stuff for helicopters. How did that, did that affect anything at all for you getting into flight school and did it affect your, your actual track in flight school? Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, when I su submitted my packet, they, they, that's something at the time they asked for, because I, so this was like 2001, early Oh two. <clears throat> and they were, the Navy was just starting this program where they're like, we're going to give you uh, 15, 20 hours of piston general aviation flying before you get to flight school. Okay. I think in an effort okay. to increase the, uh, the, uh, the success rate of flight school, because, you know, as you know, it's quite hard. So um, I didn't get that because I had about, I'd say 800 hours of civilian time. Oh, wow. That much. And yeah, but you know, what's crazy, Casmo is, so when, when I finally got to flight school, uh, the, the instructors there said, Hey, listen, you know, how many of you guys have prior flying experience? And I would say four or five of us raised our hands and they said, well, um, you know, you'll either typically guys with prior flying experience, they either do well or they wash out. And the reason is, uh, because they've been taught one way, but they haven't been taught the Navy way. Um, right. and civilian flying, even though, you know, you, we both get into flying machines, it is a different mindset mission. So, uh, I, I took that to heart and I'm telling you, man, the, I don't know how it was in the army, but, uh, at, at the time they called it API aviation, pre-flight indoctrination. I don't, they have another name for it now, but dude, the first week, I mean, I like in college, I took like three semesters of like aviation weather and like, dude, they blew through that. And like the second day of weather, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, it was, it was a fire hose and I'm looking around me like, you know, I, like, I understand this stuff, but I have to dig a little bit because it's even been a couple years by then. But like, I'm looking around like all these other cats who probably hadn't, hadn't had actual classes. And I mean, it helped, but only at the very, very beginning. Um, and that was true in the airplane too, because I remember, so because I had prior flying ex experience, they pass around the sheet, right? Like where everyone's going to primary. So in my mind, I'm either going to Corpus or I'm going to, uh, Milton Whiting field because I'm in the Navy and that's where Navy guys and gals go for, uh, uh, primary flying training. And I get the list and I'm like, Vance, I'm like, the hell what is vance I'm like oh you know my buddies around me start laughing they're like oh dude that's uh oklahoma i'm like you got no bait this is a right. you know they're like no dude because you, you have flying prior flying experience uh you're gonna go fly with the air force and uh one two super pumped about that wombat went with me he was literally like two <laughs> seats and ahead of me and uh oh, really? he was yeah he was way smarter than me though man he was like oh yeah that's vance air force enid oklahoma i'm like what is going on here you know <laughs> Uh, but so Casmo, I get, we get there and my very first flight in the airplane, it's a twin engine jet T 37, right? It's a lot of airplane. I mean, dude, the departure is like 250 knots, you know, like we're going to like 20,000 feet things that I, even I, like I'd done a little bit of like that kind of altitude and like twin Cessnas and stuff, but you know, most of your bug smashers, you're down at like, you know, 5,000 maybe. But so, you know, I, uh, in the air force, they would sit there with a, uh, with a really long grade sheet. And it was like, you know, it was like, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, pre-flight, you know, unsat. So they had to start with all unsats, right? That's how they did. And then as you progress through the, the, mm, the thing, okay. training, it had to show a curve of learning, dude. So, and the other thing they did, we would all brief and debrief in open spaces so you could hear and learn. So day, our first flight, day one, I and go, judge. <laughs> well, yeah, so two, so I go fly and my buddy, uh, uh, a couple of my buddy, Navy buddies go, there was five, five, I think five Navy guys mixed into this class and Casmo, we get back and like, dude, my debrief is like, yeah, you got about five knots fast on the climb, you know, so you wanted to pull the throttles back, but just pick the nose up a little bit, you know, and not too bad on this, you know, your, your flare is a little weird. And I'm listening there, okay. And he gives me like all like straight on sats, okay, on sat, on sat, on sat. And then like <clears throat> I look over at my buddy and the high going, These are brakes 
this is the <laughs> rudder. And I'm just like, and he got all unsets too. I'm like, I'm flying helos, dude, for sure. This <laughs> this place is rigged. I'm like, dude, there's no way. There's no granularity to the <laughs> yeah, training. Either you're yeah. if you're an ace or yeah. yeah, dude. I just did this whole like I I thought I did a pretty good flight and I got the exact same grade as my buddy who like couldn't taxi. Right. So um, but uh man, it it worked out. I I think uh, out of there there was a uh it's a Navy standard score, and what it is is like they look back so many uh, people who've gone through the program and there's like an average grade and whatever. And if you're above average, decent chance of getting jets. And I think I had like a fifties average, right? I think I had like a 62 NSS. So it wasn't crazy high, you know, at the time, the, the Navy commander there, um, commander Wood, great dude. He was like, ah, he's like, man, if you had like, you know, maybe a 70 NSS, I probably guarantee you jets. He's like, you got a good chance, you know? And, you know, but it was it was good enough. But at that time, they were given a lot of P3s and um, and other stuff. But yeah, I, you know, you know, timing, man, timing and luck. There just happened to yeah. be a, a couple spots, and I got one. And that's what it boils down to with flight school is what needs of the insert yeah. name of branch at the time. You know, and because you could be it, and I don't think people understand it. Like you could be the hottest dude uh, in this class or do that, whichever you're the best stick you got, you're Mr. Hands, whatever. And, uh, they don't have any <laughs> slots for what you want to fly. So you're flying, whatever your, yeah. your call sign is trash can. And the class after you, somebody could, could literally be just, you know, nowhere near your level. We'll put it nicely, but they got a ton of slots of the great planes that you want. And, and that's, that's just the way it, it crumbles. And, you know, I guess in your career, you get a, an opportunity. It seems to happen a lot more with the fighter guys. I talked to a lot of guys who, well, I flew this and then I went over here. Like the Air Force seems to do it a lot. I guess not as much with the Navy because you just, you don't have as many aircraft types, right? It's like, it's pretty much all Hornets at these days and, you know, things like that. But you always meet these Air Force guys, oh, F-15s, I flew A-10s with it. So. Um, but yeah, it's very easy to kind of get railroaded that. And it's really 100% uh, a lot of times timing and what's available. But so it worked out for you and that's Kasma, what you wanted. Casmo, what did you, what did you see? I'm curious in uh, army uh, aviation, how, what, how did the guys and gals with prior experience do? You know, I'm trying to think we didn't have as many because like we don't do any fixed wing flying, right? So you come straight in and you're just doing helicopter stuff. And so it's very rare to have somebody who has helicopter experience. Um, we had one lieutenant uh, that was actually in my first unit and he'd gone to North Dakota. And I think when he went to flight school is what he told me is that he basically, they basically skipped what we call primary and instrument phase. And so he just, I think he had to go and like do kind of like some basic flying and check ride, just show that he actually knows what he's doing. And then they slotted him for his advanced aircraft, which at the time was Kiowa's. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't, I think that's probably a lot more rare because again, who's paying out of pocket to become a helicopter pilot is prohibitively expensive. It's, it's just not. Man, back then you and D had a, uh, had a program with the army, um, really? some, some sort of fast track program. Cause a couple, I know a couple of guys that were in it. I mean, I was, yeah, that was a long time. It was 24 years ago. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it would have um, been around the same time. Yeah. 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 We, cause we had at the school there, they had the Schweitzer. 500s 300s they had the little little bubble where the rotax with the rotax and they had uh rotc and and they did they did have a, a like a lead-in flying thing there so i, I mean I, it yeah, has it to is. help a little oh i'm sure it does i mean any like you said if nothing else it'll take the edge off in some of that stuff where it's not like the first time that you're experiencing some of these things but I think for most of us, it's it is the first time, and, and and the system is designed for that. Like like you know, I've heard that uh, with the Air Force, where it's it starts out with the unsat. You know, it's just kind of like their way of doing yeah. it. It's just a measured system. It's I mean, it would be horribly demoralizing to me. <laughs> like right. I don't think I could handle it. And maybe that's part of what their thing is. But 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 like you said, there there's probably a progression where they're like, okay, we expect you to get unsat for the first ten days, but on day eleven, you should be getting sat in this this and this, and that's how it is. Yeah, you know what's crazy is uh so nobody so the navy scoring system in the air force was this 
like mythical beast, right? Nobody, nobody could tell you what your NSS was going to be until they took all your grades, ran it through the ice cream machine and see what, right. what, it, what it gives. But there was this <clears throat> unwritten rule that if you had 150 excellence, you would have jet grades. And man, I'm halfway through the program. I don't have one, <laughs> I don't have one excellent, you know, but I mean, I don't know. I never counted them. You know, all my Navy buddies were like, oh, I got three. I got, and I'm like, I, dude, I don't, I, I don't want to know, man. I'm just going to do yeah. as, as well as I can every day and let the chips fall. And I, I put it all out there, dude. I'm going to be happy. Well, Mover and I talked about it. And I see Mover's uh, uh, lurking. He must have heard you say something good about him. So it's like, you know, the bat signal went up and he's now he's here. Um, welcome, Mover. Yeah, that's my beard. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was I like? Oh, yeah. So but Mover and I were actually talking about this last time. It, you know, the stress of being an active duty guy in flight school is a very different experience because you are worried about those slots versus you came from a unit that's like we've hired you to be a whatever and you're chances are that's exactly what's going to happen to you. So it's a very different experience. Yeah, it's funny. You know, when I first started flight school, I was like, oh, I got to get jets. And then by like day three, I was like, I can't wash out. Yeah, dude, it's like, okay, jets would be cool. But I kind of just want my wings right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I always had like my exit strategy of like, I wanted Kiowas. Well, for most of the time, I wanted Apaches, but that's because I thought I couldn't fly Kiowas because I thought it was too tall. Right. But I always had my exit strategy of like, if I didn't get one of those two, I'd probably get Blackhawk. And then I would just drop paperwork to the Air Force and just go. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'll just go fly over there and at least I'll make more money. That was always like in the back of my mind. But that's funny, man. Come to that. Yeah. Make them tell you no, right? <laughs> that's, that's right. Make them pay you more. Um, <laughs> So, so, all right. So you graduate, you, you get jets, you get what you want. What happened then? Where did you go off to? Yeah. So I, uh, I got jets and I ended up going, which by the way, so I got, I selected jets. Uh, awesome. And then I stayed there for a while because if you selected jets in, uh, as part of the air force exchange program, you didn't do a couple phases of training. So you would actually would all actually select before we we're done with the T37 program. I mean, towards the end, but before we're done. So if you selected jets, you finished about two weeks early, <clears throat> excuse me. And if you finish, if you select anything else, you would do, uh, basically it was their low level nav course. And I think a little bit more instruments, but T45, we did that stuff. So like we, you know, you don't need to do it if you're, you're a jet guy. So the last two weeks of you uh, undergraduate pilot training for me in the air force was great because you know the pack was off and i actually enjoyed it uh there at vance uh the instructors lightened up a lot with me and um it was actually really cool but yeah i ended up going down to kingsville and <laughs> dude i got you know uh commander wood who is the navy uh, liaison uh well he wasn't a li liaison he was actually uh the commander of the one of the wings there anyways he told me he said man when you get down to navy training it's going to be a culture shock his exact words were you're going from catholic school to public school that's what he told me <laughs> <laughs> and i didn't know any different you know i had my flight suit zipped up to my chin and you know i had a uh, hiking backpack full of the four thousand air force manuals that exist dude i get down i get down to kingsville and they're like well Tall shirtless volleyball <laughs> yeah, pretty much, dude. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Shirtless volleyball. That's right, dude. <laughs> and lots of singing. It was weird. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. No, no, Caswell. I get I get down there, and it's like, uh, I go check in, and they're like, uh, yeah, we don't have a lot for you. Um, we got you on the recall roster here. Uh, if you just call in, check in every now and then, that'd be cool. I was like. Okay. And they're like, oh, hey, go down to uh, student control and get all your pups. I was like, ah, I could do that. <clears throat> dude, so I head over there and I'm like, <laughs> I never, I never forget. Dude. I went, to, you know, the Sicilian gal working there. I'm like, hey, I'm Ensign Herzog. I'm here to pick up my, you know, all my pubs. And she's like, here you go, you know? And <laughs> it's like 12 pages and like, you know, 25 font. I'm like, oh, this is the pocket 
checklist, you know, like if you don't know what to do with yourself while you're flying, you pull this out. I'm like, I need the expanded ones, like the big volumes. She's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm like, we're at the pubs. She's like, like the rules, the course rules and stuff. She's like, it's all in there. <laughs> I was like, that's it. There's no fish. <laughs> yeah. She's like, when you check in, you'll get the natops for the airplane. You know, which is a big book, but like they're like, yeah, this is it. And she's like, we don't have approach plates here. I'm like, I ain't talking about approach plates, you know. And uh, yeah, dude. So they had taken there. There actually exists larger volumes of Navy rules and regs, and they prioritize them and condensed them into one little document. And I read, I literally read through it in like <clears throat> maybe an hour. And it was the course rules on how to fly there, what to do, you know, when things happen, and literally that little pamphlet I, i've never actually broke i've never actually opened any of the larger pubs of any like nav or whatever <laughs> I mean, dude, it's, yeah so that was that i was like now i know what he was talking about so uh yeah every day i you know we spent a lot of time up at lake corpus christi water skiing um or out out in the because uh, corpus christi is obviously right by the the water there the beach spent a lot of time at the beach um, spent a lot of time with uh, Wombat. He was <clears throat> Wombat was uh, in T44s, flying out of uh, Corpus. I was in Kingsville, and um, he was uh, he bought like a Harley and stuff. And we ended up, you know, after he was done with T44s, he had to fly the T45 for carrier qual. So we lived together for a while. We just had a great time. Yeah, you know, we had you know young guys. We had cars. We were racing one another, and um, it was <clears throat> it was a good time. But I will say this. When the Navy decided it was time for you to work, you're going to work, dude. Right. So it was th their version. So the Navy's, the, the, what the Air Force does, right, is day one when you show up, they're like, okay, uh, whatever, nine months from now on this day, you can buy your plane tickets. Your family can buy their plane tickets. You're going to get your wings on this day. The Navy is like, well, water ski, have a good time. Don't get in trouble. And then when you're the priority class, we'll, we'll ram you through, literally. Uh, fire hose treatment and then all of a sudden you won't be the priority class anymore because it's all phases of training and then when you get your wings is like anybody's guess man uh <laughs> no idea literally it's like when am i going to get my wings i don't know whatever you know how how bad are you going to suck and roll back you know it's like um yeah. so yeah it was it was a completely different experience but i will say this the navy gave you a ton of rope to hang yourself with you could easily have too much fun and wash yourself out. Whereas in the air force, um, it was extremely focused. Uh, I mean, mandatory, you're just going to be here 12 hours a day kind of thing, even if you're not flying. Um, so, uh, two very different mentalities and that actually permeates into the cultures and the, the style of operation of, of the active duty that I've seen, you know? Um, and dude, it's, I, I, I've, I'll honestly say not one service is, does it better than the other. If I could take the goods, bads and others and kind of like morph it into one, that would probably be a more perfect branch, but <laughs> right, <laughs> I'm just yeah. a major. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No one's asking you. <clears throat> um, yeah, it sounds, it sounds to me like the air force and the army probably, kind of read from the the same page because uh I, I saw a comment from luke whittington we we flew together but uh yeah i i remember the duffel bag of shame we're just just gobs <laughs> of manuals and stuff and you're like stuff in here he's like i don't even know what this is um and all the yeah. other crap that they that they issue yeah it was uh you know and they're, they're like oh if it's bold you gotta be you gotta memorize it and i remember <clears throat> like dude every page of this book is bold <laughs> like, what yeah, is yeah. <laughs> i'm like what are you so, I mean, dude, the, you know, beyond the, the cultural stuff and just the way of doing business, you know, I, I couldn't compare because I didn't do T-38s as a Air Force guy. Um, but from talking with Mover and all, you know, many other guys that have done uh, T-38s and uh, IFF, it sounds very much like the way the T-45 syllabus was set up. So, you know, the we did, it was called phase one and phase two. So phase one was essentially just basic fast jet flying instruments, uh, a little bit of low level, some night, um, and some basic formation. And 
Um, they would do a mid. So when you're done with phase one, they would do kind of a workup for carrier landings, but you wouldn't go to the carrier. <clears throat> E2, C2 guys would go to the carrier. And then phase two was more was all the tactical stuff. TAC form, BFM, uh, dropping, uh, you know, dumb bombs, all that, you know, the, the fun stuff. So which is would be the IFF equivalent, uh, Air, uh, the Air Force IFF equivalent. Uh, I flew the T-45A. <clears throat> so at the time, the C was pretty new. The C was glass cockpit. And at the time, Meridian had the T-45C. Uh, Kingsville just had the A. I had, all the A's are gone now. I was uh, I was actually looking at some cockpit photos of the T-45A, and I was like, man, that, that thing looks old. But I remember when I got into it for the first time, I was like, oh, man, look how big that ADI is. You know, right. I'm, like, yeah. I'm just going to stare at that thing. Um, but <clears throat> it was it was cool, man. I, uh, you know, they didn't I can't remember how we did instrument training in the tweet. I, I don't think we were any kind of hood or anything, but man. And the T-45, I'll never forget, the, it's one of the first phases of training is instruments, <clears throat> B, BIs, basic instruments. They throw you in the back, and your instructor's like, all right, man, put up the hood. And Casmo, it is a literal tarp that you, like, zip this thing, and you are, <clears throat> you can't see. There's no cheating, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, I'll never, I, he, they have you put the thing up in the hold short. And then like the very first IP I flew, I don't know what his name is, but um, he's like, all right, man, you're going to do the takeoff. Uh, you'll feel me on the rudder pedals a little bit. I'm like, I, I, I literally have like one day flight under my belt, you know, like, I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I just, I just, I just set the heading bug, you know, whatever the runway heading was and uh, away we went. And dude, I remember taking off and, you know, you talk about prior flying experience and, uh, I'll never forget that takeoff. Cause I had, you know, he's like, okay, uh, he's back on the stick, you know? And I, you know, we take off and I'm like, I guess we're flying. And, uh, <laughs> the first, I never forget the first turn was, we we're going to go, uh, to, uh, Corpus, which, uh, by driving is like an hour away. Uh, but you know, when you're in a fast jet, <clears throat> it's a few minutes. And I remember turning yeah, right man, there. and, and, you know, you're my, my brain, even today, I, is is like uh what's first learned is is usually most retained right and so i have a hundred knot brain because right mm -hmm. your pete your uh piper warriors and stuff are cruising 100 knots so like you know about a mile before the arcs when you start turning right all that stuff is still rammed in my head so i just remember like looking at the dme and it's like click 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 and i'm right. like oh dude <laughs> i gotta get busy here so uh it was a kick in the pants man uh, the entire first phase of g45s was pretty hard for me uh, but once, uh, we got into the, uh, once I got into formation flying, I actually had to like, actually, you know, do some flying. Uh, I, I started to feel a lot more comfortable. Um, I've never been, I've never been too fond of instrument flying. I know some people just love it. Um, I like seeing things. I'm not a big, you know, <laughs> I'll stare at these instruments and cross my fingers. So, uh, but it was. It was challenging. We had, uh, we had some, uh, you know, we had some people, we had one guy who's too tall. He was a Marine. They, he, you know, they, they booted him. Um, we had a couple people, uh, quit. Um, but it was a good time, but at the same time, you know, I don't know how it was in army training, but we, I always felt like I am three flights from being unemployed, right? You, you down one flight, you get the the redo and then the you know you've messed up that when you get the evaluation when you screw up that one and then you're probably going to be a refueling officer right or just booted out so it was stressful but man i was living the dream right i, got, I mean you know me and wombat and my other buddies we were playing hard studying hard and you know at that level it was you didn't want to see anybody fail you know how it is but you guys probably had the same thing man once you got deeper in the training you start to right. build the camaraderie and i even think the instructors man the further in training i got in the navy like the instructors would let you in more to the club okay. <laughs> um and that was really cool so uh we all worked really hard together and uh and at the end of the day you know i ended up uh, i ended up doing okay i uh 
I went to the boat actually twice, not because I failed, but because we got weathered out. Um, so, you know, doing that whole evolution twice was a little, a little hair raising. And so then, you go out there normally just the one time and you do a bunch of traps and then you're done and signed off or how does that normally work? Yeah. So in the T45 <clears throat> back then you would do day. Well, you, I don't know if in the old days they used to do night in the training command, but when I went through, it was just day. You had to day qual in the T45. And I can't remember off the top of my head how many touch and goes and traps you needed. Um, all I know that it, it, it was a lot <laughs> just because like, you know, and two for me would have been a lot cause I was so nervous, but yeah. <clears throat> no, we, uh, the first time I went out on the Lincoln and I was the first, uh, person in my class to, uh, attempt a landing. And, um, <laughs> I'll never forget. I, you know, I roll out behind the, the boat and it's, it's, it's different, you know, like I'm sure mover is like totally zoning out right now. If he's, if he's, on, he's on another boat story, but yeah. you know, when you're at the field and you're practicing, <clears throat> you're way back on the power because the field's not moving. Right. Yeah. So I remember like rolling out behind the, the carrier and man, I'm way up on the power trying to keep the ball in the middle and I'm doing it. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, Oh, this is easy peasy. You're like, as soon as that thought went through my mind, dude, the old ball, like got on an elevator <laughs> start going. and I just, dude, went, it didn't have burner. Right. But I just went straight to mill LSO gave me a hard power call and I, you know, crashed into the one wire and then literally the weather rolled in and we were done. But I remember uh, my debrief uh, of paddles. Um, gosh, what was his call sign? Great dude. Super laid back. Um, oh, it was Yoda old Tom guy, guy Yoda. I remember he was like, man, and he always had a fat dip and he's like, man, I thought I was going to have to give you an okay pass on your first. <laughs> he's like, but he let the bottom drop out at the end. So that was it, man. Then I rode the boat for five days, came back and then we had to do all the workups again, man, which is all the field carrier landing practice. Um, you know, we'd practice at night in the day. I mean, you literally, man, you go out there and burn, burn a tank of gas, practicing landings and, it's, it's monotonous, but at the same time, <clears throat> you know, having kind of got a glimpse of it, I was like, okay, I need to pay attention right? because, yeah. you know, you know, uh, allegedly this is going to be an everyday thing for me <laughs> at some point right. in my life. Right. So <clears throat> went back out and, uh, uh, the second time out, man, one of my buddies had, uh, made it to the fleet as a SH 60 pilot. And he was actually out there as plane guard. Uh, when I came around for my first pass and I've, I've told on our channel, but it's worth saying here, man, I, I trapped a harness didn't lock, dude. My head went forward, slammed into the uh, UFC. Oh my God. Dude. I, I had the, you know, you tense up, I keyed the mic and I just, man, I, I screamed like a lady and you know, like I just, <laughs> and I held the mic down, you know, gave it like three right, heavy yeah. Darth Vader breaths. And then, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, you know, okay. Hook up, you know, follow your director. And like, man, <clears throat> all of my buddies in the, we, you know, they park you and they're chaining you down and a couple of my buddies are part and they're just like, they're pointing and laughing, but I'm thinking it, they're like, yeah, this is awesome. You know, <laughs> you think they're cheering. <laughs> oh, <laughs> dude. <laughs> oh yeah. So I get down in the ready room and they just, uh, the, uh, the LSOs came in and they literally were laughing and they, 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 they looked at me and they're like, Hey man, Oh shit. Oh. And I was like, and then it dawned on me. I was like, oh my gosh. You know? <laughs> but dude, we got to shore and my buddy called me. He's like, dude, I was playing guard for you. Was that you that was screaming like a girl? Because <laughs> <laughs> around the ship, you're up tower. It's one freak, right? Everybody right. hears. Sure. Air boss, the LSOs, uh, playing guard, everybody hears. So, um, but yeah, I don't remember much else about that experience. I ended up calling. The cat shot was cool. The trap was violent. Um, but yeah, man, that was that was uh and that's the dude that's the crazy thing man you do <clears throat> you do all your t45 training you know you're like two years in by this point roughly right and there's some guys that just can't do it and gals too they just can't do it um and you always wonder it's like man like i could be the greatest fighter pilot in the world but if i can't safely you know put this thing on a, a carrier I won't be doing this job. And, uh, 
you know, that makes it, you know, that makes it nerve wracking. Um, and then, you know, I, I, you know, I made it, but it's so funny. It's like, you know, you ask me after the fact, you know, how did you feel pretty confident? I'm like, no, <laughs> Dude, right. how, you know, like I rolled out behind the ship. I freaked out for about 15 seconds. There's a violent landing and I <laughs> said, thank God I'm here. Oh. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, it, well, it, you bring up an interesting point too. Like that's where the army and all the other branches sort of like diverge because so much of what you guys fly with, right. With single pilot, you've got to spend so much time because you are it. When you take that jet, you're the only guy. Whereas in the army, everything we fly is, is dual. And so they just get you smart enough to be relatively competent. And then they make you the units problem, right? They just graduate your ass. <laughs> you know, if, I mean, if you're a Blackhawk guy or Chinook guy and, and, and you don't have any bubbles, I mean, you're in flight school less than a year, well, well under a year. If you're, I think I was there a year and two weeks and I had like no bubbles and that's as a Kiowa guy. I just knew enough to be dangerous, right? I knew enough to start the aircraft, fly it kind of basically. If you took a bird to the face, I could probably get us home. Okay. But, um, but they make it the unit problem. And so, like you said, uh, it's the same thing where, you know, obviously we're not landing on carriers, but there's just certain aspects that guys just can't pick up. And the problem is it's not the school's problem anymore. Now it's the unit problem. And so that's, it's kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy between the the branches. Yeah. The, the, I don't know, man. Like I said, the Navy gives you, you know, that I don't know how it is now. You know, I, unfortunately I probably things have changed. Um, but you know, uh, when I was done CQing there, uh, the second time, so when I, when I was like, Hey, congrats, you're good to go. I flew a jet back, uh, to North Island. So we were staging out of uh, North Island, which is a beautiful base. And we're off the coast somewhere, I don't know, hundred miles. And I get in this T45 and the TACAN doesn't work. And, you know, the, the TACAN is all we had for nav. We, I didn't have a GPS, didn't have a cell phone. Well, I did have a cell phone, but it wasn't smart. Um, and, you know, so I fired this thing up. I'm like, hey, any troubleshooter? They're like, yeah, we don't know. It's not working. And so I called the rep. Rep's like, ah, dude, just launch and we'll get, you know, somebody will join on you. And I was like, okay. <clears throat> so they taxi me to the cat and I launch off this thing and no tack in and there's nobody else out there <laughs> there's no uh usually there's an instructor overhead uh, kind of watching the, the chicks right down below and there's nobody <clears throat> and so I, i'm i'm like what do i do and you know the boat's like hey yeah you're cleared off see you later so i dude i just i flew east until i <laughs> until i could see land then i flew north until i got close enough to talk to uh uh, uh, center or uh, not center, uh, uh, North Island approach. And, I went, and the whole time I just, I, as I'm flying along, I'm like, you know, there's no radar in the T 45. I'm like, maybe there is someone else up here that's going to join on me, you know, maybe, you know, but I, there's ensign, you know, heart sock with no wings. I didn't have wings yet. You know, just, <laughs> just in his T-45. <laughs> just some dude in a jet just, just flying around. Like we'll go east till I see the beach and I'll fly north and then I'll start talking to someone. So that's what I did. And, you know, that would that would never happen in the Air Force. No, <clears throat> no, um, absolutely not. You know, I uh, I got stories for days uh, with stuff like that. But <laughs> um, but, you know, it stuff like that builds confidence. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the little things, man. You, you got, you, you can't, you can't be spoon fed handheld the, the entire time. And I think that at least my capability uh, and my, what meant talent that I had, uh, the amount of rope they did give me to hang myself with was appropriate. And I was able to, you know, to make it through and like, you know, I'm not the only one where little things like that happen, but, and sometimes I think that's part of the, that's part of the test. You know, he's like, well, let's, let's, let's see what he does. Let's see if he ends up uh, in an air base in Mexico somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he starts an international incident and gets lost. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. I mean, that's where the confidence comes from when things go wrong, when everything goes right. I mean, you, you, you learn, but not nearly at the pace at which like, oh, this widget's not working. And I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, this is, this is completely irregular. Uh, 
be happening. So yeah. Yeah, dude, we're I think we're way too over reliant on widgets. I mean, I'm I'm a huge fan yeah. of all the widgets because it makes the job of being a pilot. You just sit there and you stare out the window and suck your thumb, right? But if you know, there's something to be said about the old dead reckoning and just sticking rudder skills. Oh, a hundred percent, bro. The first time I sat in one of these old ass 300 series 737s and it was just dials for days, <laughs> you know, and I've flown nothing but glass cockpit for the past 20 years. I was like a hog looking at a wristwatch. It's like, what, what have I got myself into? But after doing it for a couple of weeks and uh, it, it was like, yeah, it was a confidence builder because it was like it forced me like now we're talking airline stuff, but, you know, it forced me to understand the box more and the information it was presenting me and I could translate it. Like I didn't just stare at the moving map and be like, oh, I know where I'm at. It was like I had to literally like, oh, OK, it's telling me I'm this many miles from this place. And, you know, and if I push this button, it tells me this information. So things like that can build confidence. But. Yeah, yeah, it's it's intimidating. I, I like the widgets, but I agree with you. After a while, the widgets the widgets make you dumb. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, what you're talking about is basically it forces you to have more SA because mm -hmm. you don't have the right. yeah. you don't have mm -hmm. the generated SA just to stare at. You got to create it in your mind. Yeah, there's value. Yeah, in that. that's and that's a better position to be in than having all the widgets and then suddenly the widgets stop working in flight. Like that's a bad time because <laughs> yeah. your, your brain does not switch on. Like I tell people when you fly, you lose like 30 points off your IQ, like every flight, you know, cause as soon as you go up there and somebody asks you something basic that you could answer easily on the ground, you're like, Oh yeah. Oh, uh, left pedal. You know, <laughs> yeah. like, what was the question? Oh, I mean, it's, I, I mean, I'm sure you can, I, I mean, you ever been an airliner like at 30, whatever thousand feet and it's like cloudy down there and just like, I don't even know where the hell we are. You know, it's like, I know we're over America. I know where I'm going, but it's like, yeah. when I play the game, where am I? Right. So I'm trying to figure out, Oh, I'm in this state, you know? Oh, that's yeah. Cool. You know? So, but yeah. yeah, cause you just sit, you just follow the line. Right. All I do is look down and say, I hope it doesn't look like this where I'm going. <laughs> right. Like, it's fine yeah. that it looks like this here. I just, I don't want to mess with it. I'm not scared. I just don't want it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want it to, to be this way. <laughs> yeah. So we've spent a lot of time talking about flight school and, and training and, and good stories, but I, I do want to advance to Sorry, like your op. No, that's fine. Um, like your operational side. So when you actually went out to the fleet, like where did you end up and what, what was going on? So what year was this when you were actually like operational? Uh, finished the rag summer Oh five. So I went uh, into the, uh, the fleet or the combat air force, if you're an air force guy. So I went into this, the fleet in 05. So, uh, you know, it took a solid <clears throat> man, almost three years to even get to the, to the fleet and in training, that's all you hear about this fleet, right? It's this mythical beast. Right. So yeah, I checked into the blue diamonds, uh, VFA 146. We were assigned to John C. Stennis, CAG nine, uh, CAG is carrier air group, uh, which is basically the air wing, all the airplanes that are on the ship. So, uh, the, the ship is the ship. The air wing is the air wing. When they go on cruise or do exercises at sea, they all come together, hold hands, sing kumbaya, everyone works together, and away we go. Um, you show up as a not even a, a combat qualified wingman, so that's the first order of business when you show up. Um, I digress a little. Actually, the first order of business for me was planning the Thanksgiving uh, party. <laughs> so you get a whole bunch of you know that's 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 not in the brochure right uh right when you're especially man in a single seat navy squadron you've got a ton of other jobs so uh took on all those and then i started the they called it level two which was the wingman syllabus which really wasn't that difficult it was kind of a rerun of what i had done in the uh the rag the hornet training squadron with uh, uh, some add-ons. Uh, the big one was, uh, you know, uh, laser weapons, LGTRs, dropping LGTRs and stuff. And uh, a little bit of the air-to-air -air stuff had developed. But <clears throat> so that, that wasn't too bad. I got that. And I was a combat wingman for a while because we had a whole group of guys that were ahead of me that were going through their level three, which in the Navy, your level three was uh, a combination of your first instructor qual and your first uh, flight lead qual. So it was kind of like if you're an Air Force type, 
do they do they use the term eye pug in the in the air army? <clears throat> I've never heard that. Instructor pilot upgrade. Um, so it's kind of like a combination, of that, which is very it was very difficult. Uh, a lot of preparation and study, and uh, I didn't do that for a while, which was kind of nice because I was support for the, the junior, the JOs that, that were a couple years ahead of me. And so I actually learned a lot from them because they're your buddies. So they're right. studying, you know, and you're kind of studying with them. And then you, you're, you're out there actually doing the flights with them, right? Cause they need red air. So you're, you know, you're in the squad and you're part of the red air. They need, uh, you know, wingmen and stuff like that. So uh that was actually very valuable i actually picked up a lot from watching those guys and i the biggest thing i picked up casmo was <clears throat> the uh just how they conducted themselves right you know that that's teachers and yeah. yeah you know like you know like like we smoke and joke now right but like there's a time to mess around and there's a time to like be a little more serious and like you know, you can have fun while you're being serious, but you know, just, just how those guys conducted themselves. I, they were very mm, professional yeah. and that, uh, that was good to see, uh, because I needed that. Cause you're not taught that you're not taught right. that yeah. in flight school. Um, so those guys by going through their level three, uh, essentially whether they know it or not, you know, they mentored at least me and probably, you know, some of, some of my, uh, my friends that were, uh, also just women at the time. Cause we knew, okay. Like when I was going through, it's okay. I remember the guys, okay. You know, the night before they're doing this prep work. Okay. They're, they're reaching out to, Hey, you're going to be my dash three or whatever. Hey, can you get this? You know, like there's, it's not, you do absolutely everything. You know, they're trying to teach you to be a leader. Right. <clears throat> so just cause you're the flight lead doesn't mean you do absolutely everything. So, uh, that was, that was good to see, man. So, uh, you know, a fleet tour in the Navy is, is three, three and a half years, your first one. And, uh, man, it's a lot to get done. Your wingman qual, your level three qual, your level four qual. Some guys get, uh, like the JTAC or the FAC A qual. If you're like a two seat super hornet squadron, um, you know, you combine that with all your ground jobs. I mean, I had, a, uh, I was a, uh, division officer. So I had, I don't know, 60, 60 troopers working for me <clears throat> in maintenance. I was a schedules officer. I mean, there's a, a single, I wasn't married at the time. And I, I tell people this all the time. I, I, I would not have these, the guys that the guys and gals that are like married and have families. Um, I, I, my hat's off to them. Cause I, I don't think I could have done it. It took all of my, all of my brain bites yeah. just to do the mission, get the quals, uh, and then do my, my other duties. Uh, in the, in the squadron. So, um, it was a lot of work, man, but I look back and I mean, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I mean, every day you're not bored at work, right? You know, there's, yeah, not... and you're doing what you love, you know, <clears throat> even, even when it sucks, it's like, you love it. Yeah. Um, you know, and you know, a sucky day for me in, in, in the fighter world, when I was a young guy trying to, you know, it's, you know, it's probably like when you first showed up, man, at your first army, it's like you, you want to be the senior guys. <clears throat> right. You, know, you, you want to have that confidence. Like, you know, I used to, it's like, Oh, we're doing air to air. What is that timeline? What I do? Those guys, like, they just knew. Yeah. You know, they're like, dude, what are you stressing about? I'm like everything, <laughs> you know, and what's crazy is when like it happens and you don't even know it happens. Right. And then you're that dude. Right. And yeah. You know, you know, the, the whatever's and it, it could be as simple as the procedures, in a certain training area, or like you said, you know, just some sort of tactical thing that before you had to think about, you had to sort of pre-plan and now you're just like popping it off. Yeah. And, it, and but you never notice it until one day you're doing, you're like, Whoa, I didn't even have to yeah. think about that. And and now that I think about it, it's been like this for a while. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's weird. It, it's, uh, you know, it's a, <clears throat> you know, at the time you're like three years is kind of a long time, but it's, it's literally a snapshot yeah. and the, like yeah. the uh, amount of, growth that any pilot does who is in a at least on the navy side in a squadron like that is pretty pretty tremendous because you come in as a you know as a brand new type with really no calls and you leave uh you know a combat uh, division lead 
hopefully if all goes well. And, you know, I remember <clears throat> when I was, when I first started my level three, which was, you know, my, my instructor and my first uh, flight league qual, I remember asking the training, I'm like, why did they make it so painful? And he's like, dude, you're 20 something years old. This qual is going to give you a 20 year old knuckle dragger, the ability to climb in an F-18 with your other knuckle dragger buddies loaded with bombs and weapons, stuff that will kill <laughs> people very efficiently, go out, execute a complex mission, come back and land on a ship. And I was like, okay, well, if you put it like that, it sounds kind of important. Right, yeah, was, you know? <laughs> Dude, you it's know? silly to think back to that, though. You're right, because like you know i'm 45 now yeah. and i think about the level of responsibility right. that i had as a 28 year old it doesn't even make sense no. you know <laughs> like i don't even like my kid driving to work you know right <laughs> it's just wild to think about yeah dude yeah. i mean they give you the keys to the the killing machine you know and it's like you yeah. literally i mean you could be the one you could be the one on the tip of the spear that has to evaluate the ROE, and you better not right better not be the clown you know you better have like done well yeah. in your training and, and gotten the correct training and and know what to do how to do it and then be able to execute man because kind of like probably flying uh you know in the army the community is small so your reputation is massive you can totally ruin your reputation very quickly uh and it's hard to build it back uh i you know i had a i had a I had a good reputation in the community. I don't think anybody would, would dispute that. And you got to, you know, you have to work hard for that. Cause it, like I said, it is easy to mess it up. I mean, we all make mistakes. Uh, it's just right. how you handle yourself um, is a big, is a big part of that. And your willingness to accept criticism and, 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 and go ask for help. And that was, you know, as a, as a fleet guy being overwhelmed with, <clears throat> you know, day job kind of st desk job kind of stuff in addition to flying an airplane that is multi-role i got good at reaching out uh you know for help whether it be for my ground job or for flying <clears throat> i mean when i was getting my division league qual which is you know more than two airplanes i mean we were doing exercises in fallon and man i would land and they're like, hey, we're going to get you uh, your division DCA tomorrow. <clears throat> and I'm like, I got to go debrief from this one. I got to eat and sleep at some point, you know. Right, like, yeah. I, but, you know, I was like, hey, can you guys help me out? And so all my buddies would help me. Like, you know, my one buddy, he didn't make the kneeboard card, you know. And like, you know, we all kind of banded together. And that, you know, that that camaraderie, man, is, you know, it's it, it's hard it's hard to teach that you almost have to experience it you know absolutely what so uh, on your fleet tour did you guys go into iraq afghan did you operate in there during that time what was that like yeah so we uh we left when did we leave i don't know february of uh, 07 i think and yeah we we're going to the uh to the gulf uh originally we had all these sweet port calls we were going to do <laughs> uh, and then like once it's like once like america the shoreline disappeared they were like all right Price. boys change plans <laughs> it's like, yeah once we reached past uh human swimming distance back to shore they broke the real, <laughs> they broke the real news on us dude so they're like hey we, we gotta we're gonna go right past australia singapore all of it we're going straight to the gulf so dude they literally uh, put all the planes underneath they the broke birds they chained them down in the middle and they're like nobody go outside and then the wall started shaking and that thing just started cooking across the pacific man oh. i don't know if, i mean you weren't allowed to go outside i didn't want to find out what happens if you stick it out there but uh the ship was moving. like a wind talking about because it was just cruising and they dude, <laughs> they're aircraft, not turn around and get you <laughs> dude aircraft carriers are fast real fast really? um yeah really fast they're 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 incredible machines we would go uh out to the back of the ship there the fans and you could like i mean i remember looking down and just the explosion of water from the the reactor engines whatever that nerd stuff is doing but i mean the ship is just hauling down <laughs> um and dude in no time i mean every day we're going through a time zone kind of thing and we get we get to the gulf and we did so afghanistan was ramping up uh, quite a bit in Iraq was 
kind of quiet because Iraq was uh, in the uh, mainstream media a lot. It's like a lot of bad things happening. This was sort of around the Abu Ghraib. Yeah. Uh, 07. That, so that's probably after, right after the surge, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and for, the surge. for Iraq, right? Because Afghanistan was February, February yeah. 07. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the surge remember. started in January. Yeah. Did it? Yeah. But we, so first, man, we went uh, to Afghanistan and, you know, <clears throat> I will say this, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of uh, actual war, but uh, wartime ops, I thought was a lot. I would I would rather do wartime ops than training ops. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, training seemed like a game. Wartime ops was real. And like I said, I don't you know, I'm not a warmonger or nothing, but just the tempo was well it strips away a lot of the nonsense that just right. creeps its way into the peacetime that's what it is yeah i and i think i've i've said this on here before but you know i had a i had a captain that worked for me on my last deployment and he and it was his first deployment and uh, it was my third and he, he came into my office one day and he just sat down and he's like sir this is like so much easier than yeah back home i'm like yeah dude because we're doing what we're designed to do like none of that nonsense bullshit inspections of the the grass and the, the, the motor pool and all this, you know, random stuff. It really doesn't matter. I was like, you're just focused on your job. So yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Dude. Thanks, man. I, that's so, you know, once we actually got going, uh, it was cool. And, you know, we got out there and like, I do my squadron, my, the blue diamonds were, uh, man, all those, every, like every, all those, they're all my brothers and sisters, man. Like what a great, what a great group. I mean, even our front office, our skip, I had went through what three skippers <clears throat> in that squadron. Um, but I remember, you know, it's the little things, right? We, got, I'd been in the squadron for, I don't know, almost two years, a year and a half when we get out there and I felt pretty, I felt comfortable in the airplane, you know, pretty seasoned. I was halfway through level three. And like, I remember like the, uh, the first couple days of combat ops, the more senior guys went to kind of, figure it out and right. take notes yeah. and then they come back. Right. So I remember <clears throat> I was considered, uh, you know, one of the probably, you know, slightly junior guys, but the first, uh, time I went on actual combat mission is, uh, my XO took me out and we, you know, we go the, we get the brief, right. We go to Intel, we get the brief, we do our brief, blah, blah, blah. And I think I'm ready to go. And he's like, he's, he's like, Hey, sit down. And I was like, yeah, sir. <laughs> he's like, uh, all right, man, I'm going to, I got to tell you how to set up your cockpit and like, dude, he proceeds to it. None of this ever dawned on me. Right. I mean, I'm going to be in an airplane for eight hours. He's like, all right, man. <laughs> He's like, you're going to get some stuff to eat. You're going to get your water, get, take at least three pee bags. You got all your maps, your charts. He's like, this is how you're going to set up yeah. your cockpit when you get in there. And like, he's and like, and I, like it dawned on me real quick. Like I need to pay attention to this because dude, you know, in the Navy or the helmet bag, we never put our helmet in the helmet bag. We put all of our other crap in the helmet bag. Uh, zip it up and walk out of the airplane. We wear our helmet, right? So I remember getting out there, man, like the very first mission, like the first hurdle was was like just strapping in the airplane again. Cause I'm like, where do I by the time I had my cocoon built, I'm like, dude, if they launch anything that can dogfight, I'm screwed because I cannot move in this cockpit right now. You know, <laughs> I had like a chicken dinner stack over here and like, you know, and and it was uh still cold in Afghanistan. Right. I mean, you know, up north, dude, it's like it's like uh, it snows yeah. up until yeah, I was in the mountains. It was cold. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's it's like 90 degrees in the Gulf. I'm wearing long johns, you know, sweating. Um, so, you know, that was that's just awesome for him to have the foresight to be like gonky Bra has no clue how because i would have just be bobbed out there and been like what do yeah, i do and all for this? eight hours you would have <laughs> second right, right. You'd be like i wish i had brought out a granola bar or something yeah yeah, yeah. so can i just pee on the floor <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> it's like well anything short out <laughs> so yeah um but yeah man just you know stuff like that uh you know they took you know uh even the front office you know just you know, they uh and that squadron in particular, and I didn't realize how lucky I had at the time, but uh, we really did act kind of like a big family and, and take care of one another. So um, the first, I would say, <clears throat> two or three combat missions, I was completely overwhelmed. I mean, you know, talking to Texaco, Crowbar, you know, uh, getting all the weapon stuff ready, um, completely overwhelmed. 
you know, no yo-yo ops for me, you know, <laughs> which is one guy on the tanker, one guy supporting right. him. Like, ah, uh, <laughs> and then uh, it's, it's strange, man. Like really quick. Uh, I got very comfortable and it became just like a walk in the park, man. And it was crazy because for us, dude, we had to transit about 500 miles just to get to the, you know, just to get to Afghanistan. So we had to cruise up and down. We called the boulevard. It's kind of near Pakistan. And <clears throat> it was a solid hour just cruising on the boulevard on the way up and a solid hour cruising on the boulevard on the way back. And, uh, <clears throat> It uh Afghanistan is where we did a lot of our uh uh ordinance uh is, is where we dropped a lot of ordinance. So that's where uh you know we had most of our action. So um a little bit rare, but you know, even uh you know, strafing troops and stuff with 20 mic mic, uh which I know mm -hmm. heli helicopter, you guys yeah, it's like, yeah, we're, we're gun guns are the norm, right? But for for us, you know, for them to call 20 yeah, lights, like, yeah, it was kind of special. So, um, and then we, we went, did you have to do that at all? Yeah. Did you call in for that? Yeah. Yeah. I, <clears throat> yeah, man, my first, uh, you know, my first, so it's kind of, uh, they want everybody to have combat experience. Right. So sure. early on people are like, you know, we're seeing jets come back wings clean. It's like, oh, you know, yeah, so and so, right, yeah. you know, and then, like, you know, but for poor Gonky, it just wasn't happening. <laughs> you know, it's like, I know the feeling, yeah. right? Dude. <laughs> Everyone's getting to shoot except me. <laughs> Peace yeah. breaks out when I show up overhead, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, son of a gun, yeah. you know, and then, so, dude, it, it's really, really gnarly when like some of your buddies are like coming back like every time, and you're just like, right. bro, you know, um. So I think, so our entire deployment went like this, Afghanistan, Iraq, Afghanistan. So we did Afghanistan and then we're like, okay, we got to go help Iraq. So we went and uh, did some stuff in Iraq, which we didn't drop anything there because it was uh, a much more Different environment. Yeah. Scrutinized. Yeah. Uh, I did get to watch. <clears throat> I did get to watch a couple guys plant an IED and which was, which was crazy to me because I remember it's at night checking in you know the guys on the ground like oh yeah these guys are doing you know we get the flare on them i'm watching them i'm like oh wow you can literally see them doing their thing <laughs> and we had laser maverick <clears throat> and we we're like hey you know we can take them out right now laser maverick like, yeah we're working on the clearance dude we went through two tanks of gas they never got the clearance and we went home All right. <laughs> I'm like i'm like what are we doing here you know uh, that was yeah. very, that was very frustrating. I got back and, you know, my flight lead at the time, he's like, yeah, I knew they, I knew we weren't going to do anything. I'm like, we literally watched them plant that. I'm like, what, whatever happened? He's like, I have no idea. Um, which that, again, that was frustrating. And, uh, in Iraq, uh, I remember my skipper came back, he came back early <clears throat> from a mission and, uh, he's like, yeah, we checked in and they said, Hey, uh, he, uh, there was an ATO, right? Air tasking order that would come out daily. And that's how you knew where you were going to uh, support, right? And so the ATO came out and, you know, the skipper, uh, the schedule was written to support the ATO. The skipper uh, went out to support uh, this area he was supposed to support. He checks in. They're like, yeah, we got too many airplanes over here. Go find someplace else to support. <laughs> so he was <laughs> like, nope. <laughs> he busted a U-turn. Went back to the ship and he's like, yeah, man, he's like, what a, you know, what a, what a shit show. He's like, so he put that in his report and yeah, he didn't, he didn't go, uh, he didn't go wild dingo hunting for somebody. He just came back to the boat, dude. <laughs> but that was kind of, that was kind of Iraq, man, which was, which was a little bit, uh, demoralizing, you know, because, <clears throat> you know, we were there to do a job and there was stuff going on and we weren't able to, uh, really do a whole lot. I, I, it, it was it was interesting because uh, I got to see the rolling blackouts in, at, in Baghdad. You know, I'd be overhead and one side would go dark and the other, this whole other side would, would illuminate, you know, as they were yeah. struggling with power and um, I had an F-16 fly underneath me and burner. I thought I was getting shot at by Sam, you know, but I, <laughs> I mean, um, we didn't spend a lot of time uh, in Iraq. I think mainly because they weren't using us, right? 
And then uh, we ended up going back to Afghanistan. And that's when the, I think the second around there to Afghanistan there, I, I got, uh, there was three, I got three engagements under my belt. So, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool, man. I mean, I, I, you know, my war stories are nothing like yours, but <clears throat> you know, the first time I ever, uh, was in combat, uh, it was just me and another J.O. And I found these guys on the FLIR, you know, you check into the, you check into your, your boys and boys and girls on the ground and they would kind of use us as, Hey, look around the corner. What do you see? <laughs> right? Right, yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, like I, man, I literally saw probably 30 people walking. <clears throat> I'm like, Hey, there's a whole bunch of people walking this field. And the guy, and I'm, we're doing yo-yo ops. My buddy is on the tanker and, um, I am, you know, supporting. And he comes back, he's like, Hey, uh, all those dudes are hostile. In fact, everything north of whatever this river is hostile. Take them out. And I was like, "Oh, dude!" I, I was like, uh. <laughs> "That's the one you want. That's the well, one you pray for." <laughs> I know, Casmo doesn't doesn't quite have the ending that you're hoping for. Uh -huh. I, I was like, "Oh man," because I'm up like twenty thousand feet. You know, I, I got I got him on the flare. We got the handshake going right because we could link the flare. They could see what I'm seeing, kind of thinking. I'm like, "All right." Uh, dang it i dropped my laser bomb already i blew up this fort <clears throat> and uh i was like all i have is a gps bomb and i was like i and they're walking they're walking pretty fast i'm like i don't want to use a gps bomb on these guys oh i got the gun and i mean i did i i literally i've run this scenario in my head a thousand times i'm like dude why didn't i just a10 them <laughs> you know like why didn't i just but no, you know, I, so I got on the horn. I, my buddy had a laser bomb. I was like, do you get that thing over here? Blah, blah, blah. And so I actually didn't take him out. And the guy was getting frustrated with me. He's like, dude, what's the hold up? I was like, man, I have the right weapon. Yeah. And with 30 dudes, I mean, I, I the odds of me taking them all out of one pass with the gun, probably not. I, I would take a right. lot of them, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So what we did was we uh, watched him go into a building. And then we, uh, we sent one through the front door <laughs> and, and that was, you know, that was that. So that was my first, uh, I guess, real cast, you know, right. We got to, we got to, uh, employ, um, you know, the fort that I blew up was just something the guys, they saw, they're like, yeah, we had an engagement with some Taliban earlier and that was their stronghold. We're not sure they're all gone. Can you make it go away? So I made it go away, but like a train denial type situation. Yeah, it was a dude's building. And <clears throat> after the 500 pounds of America hit it, it was no longer a building. Um, Some dude's fort that you destroyed. I destroyed his fort. But yeah, man, then, uh, I mean, we had a couple of engagements of uh, the Taliban owning the high ground. Good good guys uh, down below where we had to strafe them. Uh, and that was cool. And that was, you know, the one thing with... Uh, when we strafe in training, we use this thing called a Z diagram and it's basically to keep you from hitting the ground and to train your eyeball and, and whatnot on when to get on the trigger, when to get off the trigger, you have no lower than altitudes. Well, dude, you know, the very first time I rolled in on bad guys in mountainous terrain in Afghanistan because they called for the gun. So that's, that's what we're going to use. Dude, I remember being in the dive and and the sun was was in front of me but i remember being in the dive and seeing the mountain cover the sun and like the <laughs> the, the, the gun reticles using laser ranging right because i got the flare on and i'm like <clears throat> and yeah, i'm watching it's the not taking into account the mountains around it <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm watching the altitude do its thing and i'm like wait a minute like does this z diagram, z, d, z diagram work if there's like a steep literal mountain right. in front of me dude and i uh, it kind of freaked me out man so <clears throat> i didn't pay any attention to the altitude i just basically as soon as i was in range man i let out a burst and i man i got on the pole and you know it was kind of a you know aha yeah. I, good thing that wasn't at night you know i'm not sure strafing at night right. would be a good idea but you know i thought man okay these you know my uh you know the sight picture that i that i have in my head on a normal strafe isn't going to work so uh, they're pretty quickly, they went to, what do they call it, slant range strafing, I think, uh, where they based your attack basically on the ranges, when to get on and off the trigger based on the ranges that you were at. So 
But mo like I said, most of my training was using Z diagrams where you were on and off the trigger at certain altitudes and you'd set the, you know, the warning bugs. Hey, if this goes off, pull off. Cause you're going to hit the ground right, yeah. and the mountain ahead of you. Right. So, um, but yeah, that was, uh, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't have, uh, the most uh, combat experience, but I mean, we had, I got to intercept a Indian bear. I got to intercept a couple Iranian, uh, Iranian patrol aircraft. That was the, the time when the Iranians, uh, captured the Brits, I believe in the, in the PT boat mm, Yeah, okay. and the Navy steamed like three carriers in the, into the, the Persian Gulf there. And it was a gigantic <clears throat> deconfliction nightmare because you had all these airplanes <laughs> flying everywhere. Not a lot of space. Yeah. That's a very tight area. Very tight. And it's, it became, you know, it was a show of force, right? So we would launch fly, man. I remember flying straight at Iran, you know, seeing, you know, their airplanes on my radar. Didn't see them visually, but I could see them and, <clears throat> you know, just flying cat fly at them fly cold fly at them fly cold and we just <clears throat> just in case they decide to send anything out um so thankfully you know that didn't escalate i, I remember being out there we had code words for uh you know for like their yeah they have f4s and F, f14s and uh, i remember there was a iranian phantom <laughs> out there and i'm out there and i just remember thinking i know he has a sparrow and i have a i have a, a nine mic if we if he decides to go hot, I'm going to be the first one to get shot down in this conflict because <laughs> the nine mic isn't going to outstick <laughs> the old right. sparrow. You know, like how bad <laughs> is that going to read the history books? You know, how embarrassing. Uh, yeah, '60s era <laughs> fighter smokes. You know, Navy fighter pilot. So, um, but yeah, so it was oh. dude. That entire deployment was was cool. We finally, you know, we got to pull in Dubai a couple times. We got to, we eventually got to pull into Singapore, um, Hong Kong even. Uh, and it was, uh, it was cool. I look back, I remember, man, typing, you know, emails of my dad, like, ah, it's miserable out here. And dad's like, dude, trust me, one day <clears throat> you're going to look back on this and cherish it. And it's just one of the many times, you know, my old man was right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, cause maybe he'd done something like this right before. So, um, but yeah, man, we we did uh, we supported uh, OEF OIF. Uh, we even did a uh, exercise on the way <clears throat> out uh, in the Pacific. Uh, Valiant Eagle, or we always joke. I, I do. We always I always get it mixed up. We always call it Spread Eagle or <laughs> Operation Spread Eagle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, then yeah, it was back. That was about almost eight months, seven and a half we'll months talk. deployment, I think. Speaking about spreading eagle, how, how did you get doing <laughs> army stuff? How did what what, what was that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Into that? yeah, man. So, uh, <clears throat> so after your three years in the Navy, uh, that's your de deployable tour. Then they're like, well, they're probably burned out and they're going to need some time to recharge. This is the thought process. So we'll do a short right. tour. Get the next marriage started. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. Get your new set of kids going. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> at the time, you know, nothing against the army, but they were seriously hurting uh, manning wise. Sure. Uh, they were tagging anybody who could go to do these things called uh, IAs, individual augmentee, I think is what it's called. Yeah. <clears throat> which was to go help the army. And at first they were voluntary and then they became voluntold <laughs> as the demand went up and the volunteers went down. Right. And so and the only thing know, left is the really shitty jobs at that point. So, <laughs> so, um, the, uh, I'm coming up on the end of my fleet tour and I know I want to go be, uh, you know, my, my, my skipper calls me. He's like, okay, what do you want to do? I was like, I don't know. So what are my options? And he goes, well, he's like, I see you doing one of two things, going to the rag, being a rag IP or going to top gun. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm not going to top gun. So <laughs> I was like, I think I want to be a rag IP, sir. <clears throat> I think it'd be a lot of fun. Uh, but at the time 
every single instructor who was coming off their fleet tour showing up at the rag because you have no quals you are the least useful to the command so who gets to go play army you do so that was the flow you come right off your fleet tour you go right <laughs> on your next fleet tour with the army and it was <laughs> six months to a year these things would last right <clears throat> uh so i knew and i was single too i'm like dude i am like the perfect shiny target right yeah absolutely. so i literally i rolled the dice i i asked my skipper and again this is just how good my front office was right i just <clears throat> i said hey sir i want to be a rag ip i said is there any way you can you know without <laughs> volunteering me uh find out what ias the detailer is going to need filled for that time period uh this was like you know nine months uh ahead at the time and if I could kind of pick one, <clears throat> he said, okay. So that's what he did, man. He reached out and he's like, Hey, come here. And he's like, okay, there's this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And there was one with CENTCOM and he said, dude, CENTCOM one. He's like, maybe forward deployed, maybe not. Right. Said, yeah. <clears throat> it's a dude, big animal when they say CENTCOM. <laughs> dude, <laughs> yeah. Oh, huge. I had no idea how, how massive of a, of a meat grinder place that is. Uh, yeah. But I rolled the dice. Man. I said, okay, if you tell the detailer, <clears throat> I will do this CENTCOM IA. Uh, if afterwards he'll give me orders to, I wanted to go to VFA 125. I wanted to go to the legacy Hornet rag. Cause I, I was comfortable in that airplane and I'm vain. I think it looks better. So, <clears throat> um, literally dude next day boom had had orders you know i made i'm like reading it i'm like okay it says that you know <laughs> there's vfa 125 at the end uh and that's what happened man so i went uh you know i, th I thought it was going to be really crappy <clears throat> but in hindsight it was it was really cool uh, i went to fort jackson and we whoa <laughs> and uh, oh, there we go <laughs> that's right it's authentic that's, that's right dude so i am i've been not making it up <laughs> <laughs> no so i went to fort jackson dude and it was uh you know that's where they do basic training right correct me if i'm wrong right yeah they, but, one of many yeah. yeah right but they had a special basic training area for folks like myself so i get there yeah. And, you know, first of all, dude, I, you go through all the medical stuff on the Navy side. And at the very end, the doc, before he signs you off, he's like, dude, is there absolutely anything that would keep you from doing this IA? Wink, wink, nod, nod. <clears throat> he's trying to throw me a bone. All right. <laughs> I was like, thanks, doc, but I'm good to go. I'm just going to go. And so he's like, all right, man. <clears throat> so he signs the thing and then away I go. Then I go check in at Fort Jackson and it was uh, a little a little bit weird. It was kind of like boot camp, but not really because dude, there were like Oh sixes. Right. Yeah. In, in the, they call it barracks, right. In the barracks with me. Um, and we were all Navy, Navy reserve types there who had either volunteered or got voluntold. You're going to do an IA help the army. So we're getting our army stink on us. So we understand, you know, when you guys would talk, we know what you're saying. But <laughs> that's a great cat, way of putting it. <laughs> well, right, cat, dude. When, when the first dude, the, the drills, are, Whoa, uh, like, yeah. yeah. I'm like, what? is there something wrong with his speech? <laughs> Every time he says something, he says hua afterwards. I'm like, is is that like meow? Is this like the the meow game was on Super Trooper? Brain damage. Too. <laughs> right, dude, what's wrong with you, dude? Um, no, but dude, Casmo, it was actually. uh it was actually some of the coolest military training I had. Dude, we shot all kinds of stuff. Dude, we went out to the range. We spent an entire day on this range for, like, I don't know how many hundreds of acres. I mean, I I sat with a 50 cal on a tripod between my legs just unloading on a on a yeah. armored vehicle, like, a, I don't know, a quarter mile out there. I'm like, the most therapeutic thing I've ever done in right. my life. That's the stuff, yeah. Yeah, I mean – shooting you know pistols rifles machine guns i mean the the amount of shooting we did was like it was awesome uh and you know the army guys especially the drill instructors they're all about it um which was really cool and you know we we sat in some classes but it was very much tailored towards you know it's not really boot camp we're just trying to show you what the army's like and the funniest part was uh <laughs> I was like all right <clears throat> uh because you know they had to make sure you're physically qualified as well and fit and dude we had we had some 
we had some Navy Reserve like docs, the doctors. Oh man, it's like, dude, you um, might not be, yeah, you, you're <laughs> there. Is there two of you under that uniform? Um, but it wasn't <laughs> it was, a maternity outfit, <laughs> dude. I, so the day of like you know, the physical fitness test, you're like, okay, uh, it's a walk, run one mile, and I'm like, what do you have to do to pass? They're like, just do the mile. And uh, so it's literally like, you know, some people are walking, I, whatever I jog, I'm not much runner, but I asked the drill. I'm like, Hey, really? He's like, he said like, no kidding. We had somebody die, like have a heart attack. Cause a lot of these, like the doctors, especially man, like they've been a Navy reservist for like 20 20 years. And you're basically taking a civilian. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You're that, a that's, general practitioner yes. in a little office, you know. Yeah. And that like they had yeah. volunteered. Like they're like, this is awesome. This is the most exciting. No one told them there would be a run. Yeah. Right. You know, and uh, they just been doing their one weekend a month for the last 20 years, right? So uh that's why they did that. But you know, I got to drive a Humvee, we got to learn how to kick down doors, um, even assault. They had a they had a town built. You know, and we assaulted it with the Humvees. And I, I learned real quick, dude, that you don't want to be the the gunner on top. That thing is terrible. <laughs> so, um, pencil mount. Yeah. yeah, it was cool. It was uh, it was a good experience. And you know, at the end of it, you know, we it, uh, I think it was maybe four weeks of training, five weeks of training, and then uh, yeah, we all went our went our own separate ways. And what was kind of funny was. Uh, so I scored really well in the on the rifle. I scored the best in my uh, in in my class, and the the and I'm not, dude. I'm I'm not I'm not a great shot. A lot of luck involved. I'm decent with a rifle, terrible with pistol. Anyways, um, the and at the time I I knew I was going to CENTCOM, which is in Tampa, Florida. And the drill instructor is like, when I I I think I was it a, a perfect score is a three hundred, right? Is that right? Uh. For, for, for the shooting? rifle m16 yeah do you remember i can't remember i scored i, I did like 40 40 is yeah expert. i i, I, I scored know. like really really i scored really well anyways they were super excited man they come up to me <laughs> i'm like, kind of oh. a big deal yeah they're like shaking my hand like where are you going killer i'm like tampa uh-huh. <laughs> like, ah. yeah so uh i lucked out man i check in at centcom uh my boss is an army Lieutenant Colonel, uh, great dude. Um, and he literally the first day, man, he's like, Hey man, he's like, do you want to stay here the entire time and work in the office? Or do you want to go, uh, and deploy and get some tax free money? And I was like, I will stay in Tampa, sir. Thank you. <laughs> I cannot be bought, sir. <laughs> so, not today. Not today, no. So uh, it was awesome, man. My uh, my brother was a firefighter in Tampa. Uh, he wasn't married at the time. So I lived with my brother, you know. So I got to, you know, put him in a headlock every day like we used to as kids. And uh, it was it was awesome, honestly. It yeah, was a great. It was nice. I mean, I grew yeah. up near McDill. Um, yeah, um, so they pick, they put you on post. You stayed, you stayed on the base. So the I job know. I had was was actually quite in- interesting. It was a result of the Abu Ghraib. Uh, uh, I worked in detainee operations, and you know, sad to say, that's kind of where I actually learned that oh, we're not actually going to win this one. We're not here to win this one, right? So right. Uh, basically, after Abu Ghraib, we had to have justification <clears throat> to keep prisoners and i was just part of that chop chain and you know the ve- i realized the f- very quickly when i was there the first person i would have to send my report to, to as justification for keeping a prisoner and some of these dudes are really bad dudes um was i'd have to send it to the the jag and i can't tell you how many times the jag would email me back and say well that's not legal and the warfighter in me just wanted to choke her out right, right but yeah you can't do that <clears throat> um uh, you know, we would get all kinds of reports uh, and, you know, you're talking about, you know, prison guards, U.S. prison guards, you know, 18 year old kids, you know, in and around these really bad dudes and they're doing bad things. And, you know, sometimes 18 year olds do things they shouldn't. Nothing life threatening. But, you know, they were getting treated as if they were, you know, literally abusing the detainees. I'm talking like your military career is over kind of thing. 
Um, so that was very frustrating to see. So that, that kind of demoralized me uh, a little bit in the sense that I just come off a combat uh, deployment. And that's the first time I kind of thought maybe, you know, all the work I did over there, you know, is, you know, maybe not pointless, but we're not, we're not trying to win, which that, that kind of made me angry because I, right. I like winning, <laughs> you know? Right. So, but besides that, the experience of CENTCOM was pretty eye opening. It was uh, under General Petraeus at the time, four star general. And it was pretty eye opening to me how uh, a very flag top heavy organization like that runs. Um, it's not a place I would want to be in any other capacity than I was in, which was basically a minion that like right. that like cut and pasted reports and made Go coffee. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, like if you're an XO. Uh, oh yeah, dude. It's your life goodbye. <laughs> you you you. I mean, dude, it's literally you're going to get the general's uh, dry cleaning. Um, you know, you're, you're literally there before he gets there and you're there after he leaves and he's there 12 hours a day. Cause you know, that's what generals do. So <clears throat> I was very thankful to have seen that and to have, uh, experienced it. Everybody I worked with was fantastic. Um, we had, a, we actually had a good time there in the office because it was a lot of, uh, us volunteers. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was good, man. Uh, I, you know, I left there with uh, with actually a better opinion in the army. <laughs> you know, uh, the colonel I work for, uh, Colonel Bezik, he was, dude, he was awesome. Like he he didn't know me from Adam, but like from day one, you know, you could tell he's he's the kind of guy that was. I uh, dude, I <laughs> so uh, I would get emails all the time, and you know, I I'm like late twenties, kind of cocky. You know, I wear my flight suit right? Everybody else is wearing their whatever, their camis. And I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't belong here kind of mentality. I'm not, like, one, of you. I'm not one of you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not one of you peoples. Look at my patches. Um, but I remember, man, I get this email. I, I had sent out this report and it was something on it was wrong. And this is when I was kind of new. And I get this email back and it just says, Lieutenant Hartsock, uh, I need you to come to my office and explain this to me. And he just signed it, uh, MG Hood. And I'm like, who the hell is MG Hood and why does he have an office and I have a cubicle? That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> a, a half a second later, a half a second later, man, both the, the colonel and the lieutenant commander was exo were like, Gawky, what did you send? Because he CC'd them. And MG was major general. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was That's like two stars. What? Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I was like, what? what's going on? They're like, who's this clown with his own office? <laughs> yeah, dude. So I, I told him, I was like, uh oh. I was like, well, I'll go talk to him. And, and, you know, the, you know, the art be a colonel, be the army colonel, dude. He's like, no, dude. He's like, I got this. Just stay there. He's like, I'm, I'm going there and get my ass chewed. Don't worry about it. And I felt bad, you know, but he, dude, that's the kind of guy he was. He just, you know, he just, uh, you know, he, he took one for, for my ignorance, you know, it's cause I, I was still learning the job and some of the stuff I put in this report wasn't right. But, uh, but yeah, man, he, it was good. I, like I said, I came away with a better opinion of, uh, of the army and um that was it man that was a short stint then i went back i went back to my people <laughs> <laughs> you're like you guys have no idea what i've just experienced yeah 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 i mean uh you know the lieutenant commander who was the xo at the time he was a prowler ecmo right and then i had replaced the p3 nav so there was uh navy aviation stink in the office there um, and you know, I got along with everybody. We, like I said, we had a, we had a good, uh, the chemistry in the office was good. We divvy up the work and we would, you know, even after we'd go fishing, like we did fishing trips on the weekend and we'd hang out, <clears throat> go to lunch together. So, you know, we got along in, uh, at work and outside of work, which, which makes it, which uh, made it a lot better. So. You know, overall, well, it's important too in those in those jobs is, and you're not thinking about it at the time, but you're representing your branch as well. It's not just about you learning about the army, but like you're leaving that impression as well. Yeah. And if you're a douche, then it's like, yeah, we had a, a Navy fighter guy. This guy was a, a <laughs> dirt bag, you know, and and that is a lasting impression as well. Well, the best part 
for me was when I left, dude, when I checked in to VFA 125 as an IP, dude, I had the force field up, you know, all the, all the, <laughs> you're like, dude, Hey, fresh meat, bro. I was like, sorry, man. I just got back from an IA. <laughs> they were like, right. they're like, Oh, you yeah. don't count. I'm like, Oh, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listening to your train up for that, I mean, I, I felt like I was uh, interviewing uh, Matt Damon preparing for a role. You know? <laughs> you're like, well, it was cool. We stayed in this, what do you call it, a barracks? And we shot all kinds of guns <laughs> and we learned how to, like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that's how, well, I mean, that that's like how it point. was, man. It was good. I, yeah. I mean, I'm, you know what's funny, man? It's like, it's like all PTSD events. I'm sure I blocked out the bad. <laughs> you right. know? And yeah. I'm just remembering the good, but. I mean, I, we, you know, <clears throat> it was, it was so strange. Like, I just remember, you know, in the air force, I don't know how it is in the army, but in the air force, like there's O sixes everywhere. And uh, in the Navy, dude, if you're an O six, you're like, <clears throat> like, on like NES Lamore, which is a, you know, the, the West coast master jet base, there might be like two O sixes at a time on the entire base. So mm -hmm. like to be at the army training, watching, Navy 06s like sweep out the barracks. I don't know, sir. Hey, I <laughs> captain, I've got that. You know, you've got, you know, go, you know, go plan something, you know, <laughs> do whatever. Right. Um, that was just so strange to me, man. So it was, you know, uh I think they made it fun because they knew that hey, we're gonna have a whole smattering of people here. And <clears throat> it really we, they didn't really try to train us to any kind of proficiency it was more exposure they did right. the only thing they trained a proficiency was uh your pistol and rifle because almost everybody else ended up going in country right so they needed to have that but uh but everything else man was just kind of like exposure and that made it kind of like a giant field trip <laughs> and dude we got you know the weekend we got weekends off right so we would we go into town and it was a it was a fun town and you know hang out eat good food listen to music you know it was it wasn't it could have been worse <laughs> yeah, it could absolutely have been worse what so there's one last topic that i i definitely wanted to talk to you about because i don't know much about it what you flew like in malaysia or something what 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 was that all about yeah so i got out of active duty <clears throat> 2012 and uh dude i just knew i was like i can't be an airline pilot um i was like i just can't, I was like, I just can't do it <laughs> i get bored flying to the area for this yeah. yeah it's like i get bored flying to the area and back you know uh so i was pushing real hard i knew that kuwait <clears throat> had hornets and i knew that boeing had a contract with them to train so i and at the time i think there was a an old job posting for it and i was like applying for it and stuff and and just just for grins i was also trying pretty hard to get a job flying with uh, aramco which was the company in saudi arabia that my dad was a mechanic for because uh as civilian flying jobs go at least back in the 80s and 90s which i know is a while ago uh it was a very good you know it was a basically a day job you know you flew a couple couple days a week out to the pump station and back. You know you were home a lot. Pay was good, schedule was good. The airplanes were nice. You know it was a it was a good flying gig. So I tried. I <clears throat> one of my dad's friends was actually still there as a pilot, and he tried really hard to get me in, but they didn't want. You know they were changing the uh, they were changing uh, you know the type of person they wanted uh, in their flying department. So um, this position came up i was actually in a brief <clears throat> i was actually giving a student a brief and like i get this knock on the door my buddy tiny books his head. he's like hey will you know with this brief he's like this is a job you need to apply for i was like uh, okay tiny <laughs> and uh let's finish the brief whatever go fly come back and it was the uh they needed an instructor pilot in malaysia and dude i like i literally had to i'm like where i had to google it i'm like where right, is yeah. malaysia? malaysia yeah and uh dude so i put I put my app in and like five months went by, six months went by. <clears throat> I'm literally like getting out, you know, uh, actually I, I had gotten out. I didn't hear a thing from them. Uh, uh, right before I got out, I did get a call uh, and they interviewed me 
And then it was just silent after that. So I just thought they'd found somebody better. And uh, yeah, me and the wife were, I was on my terminal leave. Uh, I didn't really have a job. I was going to be an F5 aggressor guy down in Key West and live in Ohio. And that was about the extent of my plan. And dude, like we, we, I'll never forget me and my wife. We, uh, since we didn't really have a job, we pulled into like, I think it was a Wendy's and, uh, for lunch and like, I get the call. It's, uh, the, the manager there, Sandy, great dude. And he's like, Hey man, he's like, uh, okay. Uh, do you want the job? And I was like, yes. <laughs> and he's like, all right, expect some emails. Then I hang up the phone. I put the car in reverse. My wife's like, what are you doing? I was like, baby, I just got a job. We ain't eating Wendy's. <laughs> you know? so I, was like, I think it took her to Bob Evans. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do whatever you want, baby. <laughs> yeah. So Boeing picked me up uh, to go uh, fly for them. And I didn't really, you know, I didn't, it's kind of like deer in the headlights, right? Cause it's a, they have, eight hornets total uh they're literally 12 time zones away and uh you know we'd never done any exercises with them or anything and i just uh once i actually started diving into the job uh as i was preparing to go over there i you know i i began to realize how lucky i was because they had russian equipment they had su-30s mig-29s uh you know it was near thailand uh, just that whole region, you know, I'm, you know, I have Vietnamese I'm like, man, I get to finally go visit Vietnam, you know, stuff like that. I'd never been, I've been all over Europe and the middle East, but I hadn't spent a ton of time in Asia. And so, yeah, we went over there and, uh, uh, I basically, you know, it's, you basically self-taught me. I was a one man band. I was, they called me Mr. Boeing sometimes. <laughs> like, okay, you Mr. Boeing. I'm like, not really. Not really, you know, uh, because my boss was in the States 12 time zones away. And, you know, while I was working, he was sleeping and it was, it was amazing, man. They treated me like I was, uh, I mean, they treated me like I was one of their own. Uh, I, the, the Malaysians dude, uh, they have, uh, they have, uh, the fighter pilot culture that I thought of when I was a kid. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. I used to tell people, like, I think flying and being a fighter pilot in, in Malaysia was probably like it was in the States, maybe in the 50s. They didn't have the same rules. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, there was just so many things. And I think a lot of that was also due in part. There's no general aviation over there. Uh, the military controls a lot of the airspace. Oh, well. Wow. Okay. So it's kind of a free for all, right? I mean, your airliners in a hurry, they're up in, you know, 30,000 feet. They're out of your hair, right? So, uh, it was, man, it was awesome. The, the flying that I, that I did there was, was by far the best. I mean, the, you know, the lowest, fastest, the best dog fights, the best BVR, the, 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 the best night stuff, like, uh, it was all, uh, there with RMAF, uh, in Malaysia and they were, dude, they, you know, they flew me, uh, you know, I always thought I was like, well, they probably won't fly me a whole lot, but they flew me a lot. Uh, you know, the limiting factor was we were waiting on parts. Jets were broke. And uh, I did what I could to help them. You know, I ended up being kind of a liaison <clears throat> between, you know, Boeing and the RMAF because, you know, there was a little bit of loss in translation there, right? You know, you, you're looking at what the customer wants and then, you know, you know what, you know, the, the manufacturer can do. And, you know, you're kind of the, the guy in the middle that just that makes it work because sometimes – you know, like they would do things that, you know, Boeing wouldn't agree with. And maybe I just, I just wouldn't communicate it in my reports back to the States. <clears throat> just because, you know, when in Asia, I mean, dude, it's, it's their airplanes. Like this is how right. they're doing business. You know, there's some of the things that happen that, uh, you know, I just, this is the way they, they've been doing it and doing it. I can see that. And I'm like, well, I'm just, I'm just going to roll with it. So, uh, and I think they could see that too. You know, the, the thing that, was unfortunate at least for me was they had bought a very significant modification to the airplane uh helmet 9x a whole lot of nice stuff <clears throat> and they said the way this is going to work is we're going to give them one airplane and the uh boeing's going to come out with a team of engineers they're going to mod it 
the Boeing test pilot's going to come out. He's going to fly it, give him the thumbs up. Our guy's going to fly it, thumbs up. And then after that, uh, we're just going to uh, meet grinder the other seven airplanes in there. We don't need to test fly them or anything. But I knew, <clears throat> I knew that once uh, less lenient uh, engineer types uh, come over here and kind of, you know, and kind of see how some of the things were done, they, there was going to be problems. And that's what ended up happening. I tried my best to get the Malaysian uh, leadership at the time to really groom the airplane to make sure it was really good. Um, and him and I butt, butted heads there towards the end because of that, because he wasn't doing that. Uh, and I, I really didn't want to, I knew it was going to cost me my job <clears throat> or uh, crash an airplane. Cause he was actually doing things that were unsafe that the other commanders uh, weren't doing. And so I, I was a little bit afraid for the guys I was flying with. And, uh, and I knew that this was just going to be bad uh, because it looks bad if, you know, a team of American engineers come out and say this airplane does not meet standards, right? I mean, you're telling that to a country, a customer, right? right. And in Asia, man, you know, uh, 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 saving, not saving face, but, uh, you know, you don't, you definitely don't disrespect somebody in public. Right. Yeah. Right. And, it, you know, and having been, I live, you know, and work with, with, I just, you know, I just knew this is going to be bad. So I did my best to try not to, you know, have that happen, but it didn't work. Uh, I ended up, <clears throat> you know, Boeing actually uh, ended my contract because they had, they got enough data to say that they thought the airplanes weren't safe enough for me to fly, which I don't think that's exactly the case. But <clears throat> um, so we came back, they offered me uh, to go to Kuwait. Um, I turned it down uh, and then just decided to come back to the States and and slug it out with with everybody else. So that was sad. My wife, man, she cried when we left Malaysia. Oh my God, <laughs> she cried. I was like, oh man, <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, when we first got there, she cried because she was sad. And then about two weeks to do wait. it, she was like, oh wait a minute, this is awesome. Wait. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, yeah, and we you were there for how long? <clears throat> a little over two years. Yeah, not long enough. I mean. Dude, by far best flying job I've ever had. And I don't, you know, uh, the Malaysian pilots, the Malaysian maintainers, all great people, very professional. They did, you know, they, they all did the best, uh, that they, that they could given the system that they're in. Right. You could, there's all kinds of stuff in the army and the air force and the States where you're like, this is dumb, but we're hand, handcuffed by the system. Right. And that's, that's where they were at. But dude, it was just rad because as a fighter pilot, man, uh, I spent my entire 10 ish years in the Navy studying about MiG 29s and Su 30s and flankers. And, you know, I'm over here as a civilian, like touching them, flying with them, right, flying yeah. with them against them. Uh, it was, I just remember emailing my buddies that were still in the fleet. Like I'd send them still shots of me, you know, <laughs> I'm like, oh, check this out, bro. You know, uh, <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, you know, are you doing a cast hop in Fallon again? <laughs> you know, right. Are you the recovery tanker? <laughs> So, and then, yeah. so after that, you came back to the States and that's when you were doing some red air flying. Yeah. So, here in the States. so as part of that upgrade, they, uh, they sent out, uh, they sent out, uh, I don't want to get you in trouble with this call sign. They sent out a Hornet dude, um, who was at VFA 204. But he had a civilian job. He had two civilian jobs. He was an American pilot, and he worked for I can't remember some civilian company that was involved with the upgrade that was going on with the Malaysian Hornet. He came out. I was like, I need to meet up with this guy because maybe he can get me in at VFA two hundred four down in New Orleans. So met up with him, man. Had dinner, talk, and uh, he kind of explained. I had no idea what the reserves were like. You know, how, you know. What's how much you need to participate? You know, what's a requirement? How much money do you normally make? You know, all this stuff. So he answered all that stuff. And then I, I told my wife, I was like, listen, being just a, a reservist, we have any kids at the time. I was like, we'll, we'll be just fine. And so, you know, uh, I had a good time with him there. You know, he went back to the States. He gave me some contacts. I, I knew it's all who you know, right? I knew a couple of guys that were in the squadron. 
you know, you know, sent him my resume. Hey guys, you know, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, I got back to the States and I, you know, showed up for a couple days on a drill weekend with my <clears throat> resume and smiley face and a bottle of booze. And, you know, luckily they took me and, you know, flying a VFA 204 was, was, was awesome too. Uh, one of my best, one of my better uh, stateside assignments because everybody in the squadron was super experienced, you know, and we're not really nobody. The, the politics is pretty, pretty light because, you know, pretty much everybody else in there had an airline job. Uh, you know, we're all there just to kind of, you know, relive the good old days <laughs> in the F-18A, right, yeah. you know, so we would go and support and that's where I met Mover. We would go support uh, the Blue Air and Fallon, you know, and, you know, I remember being Blue Air and Fallon. That's a ton of work was well, Red Air. <clears throat> I mean, <laughs> it can be some work, but at the same time, it's like, well, hopefully they shoot me and I die. Right. <laughs> it's like, that's, oh, yeah. that's the point here, right? <laughs> we're going to test them. You know, if you're blue air, you're like, Oh God, please. You know, I hope I don't die today. <laughs> it's like, right. there's a different uh, level of stress. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, it was, it was, and, and it was like a, a mini reunion, right? We go to the club afterwards and I'd see some guys I hadn't seen for a couple of years and get caught up. So it was a good tour, man. I mean, we, uh, we were hurting for airplanes though. There's many times we had one jet, and we would just fly that thing till it broke. <laughs> um, we were so desperate for airplanes, Casmo. Uh, Navy, big Navy was like, y'all want a B model down there? And we're like, <laughs> sure, send it. So the B model, dude, it was like, I think AIM-7 only is a two-seater, right? We were single-seat squadron. So <laughs> it's like, does it fly? That's all we care <laughs> about. We just care about it flies. <laughs> so, yeah, it was good. I spent... Uh, couple years there you know almost right away though you know i, I met mover and you know i what i did was i i still didn't want to do the airline thing so i started a uh, small real estate company so i started buying and selling land um so i was doing that and doing the reserves and uh it was about a three and a half hour drive from me new orleans and mover was like hey i'm going to this air force thing that's down at tyndall it's even closer for you uh, and also, man, in the Navy Reserve, my 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 shield from doing that Army IA had uh, uh, gone away, and now I was yeah, on the hook. Off. Yeah, I was on the hook again. <laughs> and dude, they were talking IAs again, and I'm like, I'm not. And you were well trained already, so just a quick <laughs> no, I'm like, no. Now I was married, and like, I'm like, no, I'm not doing that, dude. So, um, I was like, I got, I can't stay here, which was unfortunate because I did want to stay. I wanted to stay at 204, but. Um, they kind of pushed me out of there, uh, because I just knew that I would probably be somebody to take, uh, to get nailed with one of those. So yeah, man, put in my packet, uh, to go to, uh, transition the air force. And it took, dude, it took over a year. It was shocking to me how long of a process it was. And that's how I, I got into the T38, uh, with mover. So that happened. So uh, that basically happened. I switched over the air force, uh, very, very beginning of 2017. So I had a, about a, was that about a 15 year run in the, in the old nav and, uh, switched over crossed into the blue. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're cruising last little bit to retirement. Yeah. Yeah. You know, man, it didn't, it's so funny. Mover and I talk about this a lot cause we're both damaged goods. Even on that, <laughs> uh, it's like we're a little team of damaged goods, but, uh, like I never thought my career would end like this. You know, I'm, uh, I'm very happy where I'm at now because the people are fantastic. <clears throat> but you know, if you had asked me like young donkey, Hey, how's this going to end? I'm like, ah, probably me versus eight bandits. You know, I'll probably smoke right, five yeah. of them before I'm Winchester, you know, it's <laughs> one of those, you know, go out with a blaze of glory. But <clears throat> you know, I, uh, you know, I, I fought the mandate and, uh, it ruined my, uh, flying career. And, uh, because of hurricane Michael, I ended up being trapped in the command I was at. So, uh, the command I was at because of hurricane Michael was closing and because I was fought the mandate, nobody would take me. Uh, and the clock is ticking and, you know, wasn't getting any younger. And so by the time the mandate thing got figured out, <clears throat> uh, you know, I don't have a lot of time left. So, 
thankfully, uh, a couple of uh, really awesome uh, people uh, picked up Mover, and then we always like to joke it's two for one deal. <laughs> so they uh, they picked me up too, gave me a chance, and uh, I've been doing my best to make good on you know the opportunity they've they've given me to. I, I can close out my career, dude, or I could continue. Uh, I could actually get back into flying, not fighters, probably heavies. Um, I don't know if I want to do that. I'm still kind of grappling with that right now. But um, but uh, honestly, Casmo, I can't. You know, I go back. Would I change anything? Honestly, I don't think it would, man. It's been an awesome ride. I've met so many people. I mean, I, I wouldn't. If I would have done the na normal Navy stay 20 years, well, I would never be talking to you right now. Right. So I know you, <laughs> your story. I'm serious, man. Like it's, uh, you know, uh, you've got a pretty amazing story as well. And, uh, it's just been a lot more, a lot, uh, more dynamic of, uh, you know, 20, 24 year run than, than normal people have. So I'm glad I, I don't have any regrets. Yeah. I remember, you know, as, as a tank guy, uh, that's what I started my career as. And it was a big risk. It was a big jump to go into aviation. You know, I took, you know, basically a rank cut and everything. But I remember saying to myself, I'd rather be at the end of this career and be able to look back and say, I had fun and I did cool stuff versus I hit all the all the things along the path that you're supposed to do. And I think most of us probably leave our career um, and, and say, I didn't expect it to end the way that it did. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's just, just different. Um, but yeah, I feel the same way. Like I can't complain all the, all the good stuff that happened and all the cool experiences. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man. I mean, I, you know, <clears throat> and having served with another country's military, like here in the States, we're like extremely lucky right like in malaysia there is no reserves <laughs> right yeah. you know it's like what do you, they're like eight Whoa. planes <laughs> <laughs> right exactly the training unit and the and the the combat unit is one place like right. the same airplane <laughs> dude you know um so uh you know our the the size of our military and just the 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 way that it's set up uh you know I'm just, I'm lucky to have been born in this country to have the opportunity to, uh, have, 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 uh, taken the path that I've, that I've, that I've taken. Cause that doesn't exist in a lot of other countries, man. So, I mean, I can't, it's really hard to complain. I mean, I, <laughs> right. Yeah. Nobody would listen. <laughs> no, I'd probably still complain though. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd... I always say if, if you're a pilot, and you're not complaining, there's something wrong with you. That's, that's true. They should probably check on you, but, uh, yeah, especially, if, especially if you're an airline pilot and you're not complaining, you've, there's something definitely wrong with you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I eventually, you know, I was doing the real estate thing. I still buy and sell land. You know, I kind of ventured off. I got a, a couple small trailer parks and stuff. So I, I really love real estate. Um, mover kind of wrote me into the YouTube. Yeah. You know, it's so funny. It's like when he, uh, when his channel was starting to go on, I was like, man, I got this, like, I got some really cool footage of like flight and flanker. And he's like, dude, you need to put, you need to start a channel. Right. So I, you know, so I'm kind of, you know, I'm dabbling in this now, which is really cool because, you know, we talk about these things, Casmo, and it's funny just talking with you and his like old stories that were buried in my head. Right. But now I've said it, it's recorded. And like, you know, maybe one of these days my son ever wants to, or my daughter yeah. wants to hear dad's old, stories he can just they can just watch this right i might get run over by a truck tomorrow you never know um so it's kind of preserving that and you know one of the things that i always love doing is i love reading about like world war ii vets the things that they did right like all the shows saving private ryan all that stuff's fascinating to me you know like if it was me every vet would have a youtube channel with all their stories um but you know then i eventually you know i i, uh, I did you know i i'm, I'm also a uh I fly the airbus a little bit now so um, I have widened my aviation <laughs> abilities a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, I'm also an airline guy, uh, now in some capacity. So, uh, so it's all good, man. I just, you know, um, who, who would have thought you could, you could have an entire life, uh, anchored by a flying machine. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and have such a life. The, well, that's one thing military does too, is you, you compress a whole lifetime's experience into like, you know, 15, 20 years very easily. And then it's like, Oh, I got this whole other life, 
You know, I always looked at like retiring from the military. It's like, well, it's time to to sit back in the old rocking chair and hang out till <laughs> death, you know? And then it's like, wait, I got to get another job. Holy shit. And you know, and I got to pay all these other bills and I got this whole other stuff that goes on. I got, but I have so much more opportunity to do stuff that I want to do. So, um, yeah, there's certainly uh life after, but yeah, it's weird, man. I mean, you know, when you first started, right, you're like 20 years, God, dude, now I look back, I'm like, I just, that was like a, like a flash in the pan, man, you know? Oh, I remember, and I remember seeing those guys who were like, you know, 15, 20 years in, and you're like, they looked old as shit. And then it's like, oh, he's 30 and eight, you know? Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> us now, for sure. For exactly. Sure. It's us. For exactly. Sure, but dude. then you see that same dude after he's retired, like 10 years later, and he looks younger than he did when he was, you yeah. know, in those last days of the military. Yeah. So it's, you start yes. to get some of your life back. <laughs> yeah, you lose the stress and the facial hair begins to cover all the damage. <laughs> That's it. That's it. All the scar tissue. Uh, 100%. Yeah. Well, uh, cool, man. Yeah, we've shit, we've done two hours. I, there was some sort of YouTube drama. It says there's only five people watching. I know that's not true. I think it was around like 200. So we had a good crowd here tonight. And uh, I did see uh, some gifted subs. I think that got saved. Or where's it at? It's the start. There it is. Uh, yeah, there it is. Thanks for that, Jake. Nice. Uh, so thank you, Aaron. And uh, I, again, I see in the chat some people have been trying to to do different things. And I, YouTube's uh, taking a holiday, I guess. But um, I appreciate <laughs> you guys watching. And uh, again, if you, you're probably familiar, it, but if you're not, uh, Mover and Gonky Show, uh, they do it pretty much every Monday, uh, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, you haven't you haven't had a real break in that so that's good because that's the key to youtube is consistency yeah. i do not have consistency um <laughs> but it's a good show you guys should definitely go over there and check that out and give the give them uh, your love and support i would love to come back on next time you guys need yeah. me just let me know uh, yeah. especially because as you can see with the beard that means i have nothing else to do so uh <laughs> so I have nothing but free time uh for the next month or two but um well, cool. Thanks so much for coming on, Gonky, and thank you for your service and uh, for all yeah, the cool man. the cool stories, man. It was great talking to you. Yeah, man. Anytime. And we'll, we'll definitely have to have you back on. I mean, it's not like we got people kicking down the door to come on the Mover Gonky show yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> yet. Yeah, one of these days, it's going to happen. Days. That's right. It's going to so. happen for us. Yeah. Well, cool. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for watching. And night, uh, we will see you guys later. Things gonna work, and yeah, Gonky, just hang out for a second, and uh, oh, okay, we'll let that play. <laughs> What's going on?